And you'll notice that as we progress towards the end of the Qur'an, many of the surahs will get shorter and shorter. So, Ahqaf means the sand dunes. And this refers to the place, the area, where the people of Ad resided, or the region that they lived in, where the adab first came upon them. The surah opens up with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's absolute power, and that this whole system of heavens and earths has not been created in vain. It has been created with purpose. Just like today, some students were asking that why, why so big, why so vast? Why all these galaxies? And it just keeps going and going and going. And we don't live there. So what is it for? So only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what it's really for, but it's a sign of the qudra of Allah. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to say, Allahu Akbar, imagine how great Allah is, how grand Allah is. So if there was no other purpose other than to demonstrate the adama of Allah, it would be enough. So he says that none of this is in vain. And it is all created up to a fixed term, ajrim musamma. However, the people who choose to disbelieve continue to turn away and ignore the warnings that they are given. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that ask these people who call upon gods other than Allah that show me what they have created. Show me what part of the earth they have created or do they have a share in constructing the skies? What is it? What is their role and what is their function here in the origin of things? And I would like some written proof of this. I would like some documentation. And if you documentation, then give me some reliable narration that I can, I can depend on, something that has been transmitted in some <laughs> authentic way that we can rely on to prove that those gods actually exist and they have some role in the creation and in the running of this universe. Who could be more lost? Waman adal. Who could be more lost than the one who calls such things, calls upon, worships, prays to, such things that will never respond to him until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. In fact, they're not even aware that, they're, that they are making those prayers and those offerings. And those beings, those people, on whose name they have taken all of these gods, on the Day of Judgment, they will be their enemies. So some people, after hearing our verses, they say that this is some kind of magic. Yes, they're very powerful. The verses are very powerful, but this must be some form of magic. That's where it's getting its strength from. And is it that they're saying that you have made this up? So tell them that if I did make this up, then you could not save me from what would come upon me. فَلَا تَمْلِكُونَ لِي مِنَ اللَّهِ شَيْئًا If I were to make up something, meaning... If I were to falsely attribute something to Allah, make it up myself and say that Allah has said it, then there is nothing you could do to stop the wrath of Allah from befalling me because it would come. So Allah knows better about these claims that you make. He is enough as a witness for me and you. And look, I am not the first prophet. مَا كُنْتُ بِدْعًا مِنَ الرُّسُلِ I am not some unique prophet that has... Like nothing like this has come in the world before. No. Many, many prophets have come. And so I am one of those prophets. And the other thing is, I do not have the knowledge of the unseen. I do not know exactly what is going to happen, neither with me nor with you. I don't have the knowledge of the unseen. I simply follow what has been revealed to me and I am just here as a warner. Now, what if it is from Allah and you continue to deny it and there are reliable people from Bani Israel also who are testifying to its truthfulness like the scholars of Bani Israel, people like Abdullah ibn Salam and Maymun ibn Yamin who was, the, he was a great scholar of the Jews or he was the head of the Jewish scholars, Zayd ibn Sana, 
all of these people, they're saying that this is true. So, not only did they testify to its truth, but they accepted it. They accepted it, and you're acting arrogantly. In the Allah, la yahdil qawm al This is in fact very unfair what you're doing. Allah does not guide such people. Then, another hindrance for the disbelievers is that they used to say that if there was any good in this, then we would have beat these people to it. Because they see the likes of Bilal, for example, and Suhaib, and Salman, and Khabbab, and these people that they used to look down at, they said, if there was any good in this, we would have had it first. How could these people, whom we look down at, um, have it first? So, because they did not get it first, well, they say this must be a lie. If it was good, it has to be with us. If there was anything worth having, we would be the first ones to have it. Those people who take Allah as their Lord and remain steadfast, there is no fear on them, nor shall they grieve. They will enter into Jannah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays out their, uh, their rewards. And the emphasis that Allah has given to the human being regarding their parents, that He must treat them in the best way possible. His mother carried him in her womb with a great deal of pain and delivered him with a great deal of pain. And then after that, the, the period of weaning the child. So it's not just um, the pregnancy, but it's taking care of the child and breastfeeding the child for a period of two and a half years. And then there's two outcomes, one of two outcomes. Some of them, when they reach their, they, when they reach their, their prime, balaga ashuddahu, they reach their prime, their full period of strength. Wa balaga arba'ina sana, they reach the age of 40. Some of them say, O oh Allah, Give me tawfiq to be grateful to the bounties that you have bestowed upon me and upon my parents. And he make, allow me to be grateful to you for the bounties you've given me, but allow me to be grateful to the, for the bounties you have given to my parents as well. Subhanallah. Give me tawfiq to do this and also to do good deeds, such good deeds that you will be pleased with them. And O oh Allah, you rectify, correct, preserve my progenies for me. I make toba to you and I am from those who have submitted to you. Allah says for these people, people with this kind of attitude when they reach that age, Allah Azza wa Jal accepts from them the best of they, what they have done and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardons their mistakes. This is a truthful promise that they have been made. And the other outcome is the person same, goes through the same process, same parents, but they grow up and they say words of disdain. Ufillakuma. They say words of disdain and um, insults to their parents. The parents are saying, look, come to Allah, start praying, start fasting, believe in, believe in Allah, turn towards Him, make dua to Him. He says that, are you trying to promise me that I will be, I will be resurrected? Even though many nations have passed before me, I don't see any of them coming back. And they're making dua to Allah. They're saying, oh Allah, help us, help us, help us. They're saying, what's wrong with you? Have iman. Allah's promises are true. He says, nah, these are all just stories passed down from the, from the previous people. These are the ones upon whom the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has passed. And they will be just like those nations that have come into the world before them from amongst jinns and human beings, that they will be losers. Each person in this world will have a status based on what they did, not based on their parents. In both cases, the parents did their job. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not judge us based on our parents. If the parents were good, that's great. But that does not necessarily mean that they will answer for our mistakes. And if the parents were bad, it doesn't mean that we can blame them for our mistakes. Rather, لِكُلِّنْ دَرَجَاتُ مِمَّا عَمِلُوا Everyone, once, especially once you reach the age of discernment, you're able to decide for yourself what is right and what is wrong. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives everyone the full compensation of what they have done. They will not be wronged. And as for those who disbelieved, then they will be taken towards the fire. And they will be said that, look, you 
wasted all your all the favors of Allah, all the bounties of Allah in this worldly life. Adhabtum tayyibatikum fi hayatikum dunya. You used it all up in this in the worldly life and you enjoyed them, but now you have to face a punishment of disgrace. Why? Because of your arrogance and because of your open disobedience. And while talking about arrogance and open disobedience, briefly the story of Ad is mentioned, how Hud salam reminded them. And you see, they, they were afflicted by a drought. And these people, they sent a delegation to Baytullah. Said, we will go there. They used to believe in Allah, but they used to do shirk. But they did believe that Baytullah is a sacred place and prayers are accepted there. So off they went. And this delegation, the whole time, because they were people of disobedience and arrogance, the whole way they enjoyed themselves, had parties, drunk, they had their um, you know, people to play musical instruments for them, they had taken their wine with them, and like this is how they moved, this is how this procession moved, so much so that when they reached the outskirts of Mecca and they, they pitched camp there, there also they were doing this. So there was a man who lived in Mecca at that time, his name was Muawiyah. He sent a message to them through his slave girls and with very eloquent poetry, they gave them a message. And in that message, um, they said, look, you people have come here to ask for rain. أَلَا يَقِيلُ وَيْحَكَكُمْ فَهَيْنَمْ لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ يَمْنَحُنَا غَمَامَ فَيَسْقِي أَرْضَ عَادٍ إِنَّ عَادٍ قَدَمْ سَوْلَا يَبِينُونَ الْكَلَامَ مِنَ الْعَطَشِ الشَّدِيدِ فَلَيْسَ نَرْجُو بِهِ الشَّيْخَ الْكَبِيرَ وَلَا الْغُلَامَ These people have come to pray for rain. Let's go and pray because Qawm Ad is so badly afflicted that they can hardly talk. And this is what, what, has, what had happened with them out of extreme starvation and hunger. And we don't think that the old will survive this, nor the young. And وَقَدْ كَانَتْ نِسَاؤُهُمُ بِخَيْرٍ وَقَدْ أَمْسَتْ نِسَاؤُهُمُ أَيَامًا Their women used to be hale and hearty and healthy. And now, one by one, they are becoming widows. فَإِنَّ الْوَحْشَ يَحْتِيهِمْ جِهَارًا وَلَا يَخْشَى لِعَادِيٍ سِهَامًا Wild animals, beasts, are coming into their towns and attacking them. They do not have the strength to pick up an arrow and shoot it at them. So they describe this whole scene and then they say, وَأَنْتُمْ هَا هُنَا فِي مَشْتَهَيْتُمْ نَهَارَكُمُ وَلَيْلَكُمُ تَمَامًا That's what's happening back home. And you people all day, all night, you're just doing this? And that's after coming to Baytullah? So his final message was, فَقُبِّحَ وَفْدُكُمْ مِنْ وَفْدِ قَوْمٍ وَلَا لَقُوا التَّحِيَّةَ وَالسَّلَامًا May this delegation of your nation be ruined and destroyed. And there is no welcome for you here, there are no greetings for you here in Mecca. So when this message came to them, they said, oh, oh yeah, we're here for this purpose, we're here to pray. So now let's go into Mecca. So they went and in front of Baytullah they started making dua. So some narrations mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them three options. Three types of clouds. They had to choose one. So there was a red and there was a yellow and then there was a black one. They said the red one looks like a storm. The yellow one looks like it's carrying some kind of disease. The black one, yes. Black clouds bring rain. We want that one. So now they're coming back and this cloud is following them. This is where the Quran picks up the story. فَلَمَّا رَأَوْهُ عَارِضًا مُسْتَقْبِلَ أَوْدِيَتِهِمْ قَالُوا هَذَا عَارِضٌ مُمْتِرُنَا When they saw that cloud coming towards their settlements, towards their, their, their valleys, their towns, they said, finally, yes, well, this is a cloud that is going to bring us rain. Allah says, بَلْ هُوَ اسْمَسْتَعْجَلْتُمْ بِهِ Just before this, they were challenging Hud alayhi salam, they're saying, فَأْتِنَا بِمَا تَعِدُنَا أَنْ كُنْتَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ Bring it, bring that punishment, bring that wrath, bring that wrath. He says, this is that wrath that you wanted so eagerly. So, رِيحٌ فِيهَا عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ So that cloud 
unleashed a wind. And that wind, تُدَمِّرُ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ بِأَمْرِ رَبِّهَا It destroyed everything. فَأَصْبَحُوا لَا يُرَى إِلَّا مَسَاكِنُهُمْ The only thing left were their homes. So, arrogance and disbelief, what it looks like, what its people look like, the Qur'an gives us an example. Allah says that, I gave them much more than I've given you people, O people of Makkah. Much more power, more land, and you, they were intelligent also. They could see perfectly fine, they could hear perfectly fine, they had hearts, they had intelligence. But none of it was of any use when they started denying the verses of Allah and refusing to believe in them. And then they started making fun of it. The thing that they ridiculed came and surrounded them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Like this, we have destroyed many settlements around you in your surroundings. And we have explained our verses in many, many ways so that people come back to Allah. And why wasn't it that those gods that they took besides Allah, when Allah's punishment came, how come their gods didn't come to their rescue? And then there is a story that's mentioned, a group of jinns came. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, he diverted a group of jinns towards Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa These were jinns from Nasibin in Iraq. So the Prophet sallallahu was standing in his tahajjud reciting the Qur'an. So this group of jinns that was passing by, they hear this recitation and they stop. And they say, hey, this is, this is something different. And they all said, okay, everyone be quiet and just listen. So they sat and just listened to the recitation of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam finished his salat, they went back to their people. And they said, Ya qawmana inna sami'na kitab. And we've heard there is another book that has been revealed after Musa alayhi salam. Now why didn't they mention Isa alayhi salam? Because he came in between. Possibly because the, uh, the Injil was very, very similar to the Torah. In fact, it was like a, an extension of the Torah. And most of the teachings were exactly like it, except for a few things. So possibly that's why they mentioned the Torah and not the Injil. So we've heard another book now being recited and it confirms what was revealed before it. It's guiding towards the truth and towards the straight path. So, oh people, this is the caller of Allah who is reciting this, Muhammad wasallam. We should go and listen to him. We should go and accept his message and believe in him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins and save you from a dreadful punishment. And whoever does not respond to the call of Allah's caller, then there is nothing he can do to stop Allah's punishment in the world, in, in this earth. And there's no one who can help him. And those people are lost. And then there are signs. They talk about the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's greatness, how he created the heavens and the earth, and so on and so forth. So this group of jinns went back, and then they, uh, their whole tribe came and accepted Islam at the hands of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And there were several occasions in the life of the Prophet ﷺ when groups of jinns came, accepted Islam, and Nabi ﷺ taught them the deen. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was one of the companions who accompanied the Prophet ﷺ on these, um, on these trips. But the Prophet ﷺ would take him up to a point, and then he would say, he, he drew a circle around him, so you stay inside this circle, you do not step out, no matter what you hear, no matter what you see going on, you don't step out of it. And he, used, and he used to say that, I used to hear such frightening noises, I was so scared for the well-being of Nabi Wasallam. I wanted to jump out of there, but then I would remember his warning, and it was a big fight for me to stay there where the Prophet Wasallam had positioned me after hearing such frightening things. But those were just the sounds that the jinns were making. <coughs> so, as for those who reject the message, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that فَصْبِرْ كَمَا صَبْرَ أُولُو الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ Be patient and persevere like the prophets of resolve did. The great prophets like Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam. Just like these prophets stood their ground, you should also do the same. And don't rush, don't seek the punishment early for them. لَا تَسْتَعْجِلْ لَهُمْ Their time will come. 
And when they see what they have been promised, then this whole life will seem like it was just sa'atam min nahar, it was just a few minutes of the day. And um, your job is simply to convey balagh. Your job is just to convey فَهَنُّهُ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Who else is destroyed but those who openly disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After this is Surah Muhammad and this is a Madani Surah of 38 verses and it opens up with the, the trouble that the, the, the disbelievers, the people of Makkah, uh, of Makkah were causing for the Muslims in Medina. So those who disbelieved and are keeping people away from the path of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made all their deeds void and null. Those who believe and do good deeds and believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa what has been revealed to him, knowing that it is the truth from Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives their sins. Now, why is that? Because the disbelievers follow and chase after falsehood and the believers, they follow haqq that has come from Allah. So because this is their role, their role is to follow falsehood and to spread falsehood. And now they come into, uh, with that same campaign of falsehood, they come into battle against you. What should you do? What should you be your approach? The armies are facing off and they're clashing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you strike. Strike their necks at that time. Don't sit around, don't fall weak. And... The command is that you must first fight and fight and fight and fight until the war has been won decisively. Don't stop it halfway. Because what will, you, what will you be doing? You will be giving them strength and courage to come back again. So they must fight to a certain extent. They must win decisively. Only after that are they allowed to take prisoners. Once you have seen that definitely... And irreversibly, we have won this battle. Now you can take prisoners. And after that, فَإِمَّا مَنَّمْ بَعْدُ وَإِمَّا فِدَاءً Then it's your choice. If you want, you can release those prisoners just as a favor to them. Or you can take ransom for them. Now some ulama have said that this, is, this verse is mansukh because Surah Tawbah, which was revealed after it. So there's a lengthy sort of a fiqhi type of discussion. We won't go into it right now. But this was the option that was given. And those options are... The, the option of taking prisoners is only valid as long as the war is ongoing. Once the war has ended, you cannot go and capture civilians. You cannot go and take people and kidnap them and say, okay, these are our captives. Or these are prisoners of war. They're not prisoners of war because they did not come out against you. So it, it gives us that rule as well. And then he says, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need you to fight against his enemies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have taken revenge himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses some human beings to test others. And this is your test to see. It's not a test to see what Allah can do. It's a test to see what His slaves are doing when the time comes. This world is not created as a test for Allah. It's a test for us. So it's about what you do. And also those who lose their lives in the process, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never let their good deeds go to waste. Rather, their deeds will reach their place and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will rectify all of their affairs and enter them into Jannah. O oh, believers, if you help Allah, meaning if you help the deen of Allah, then Allah will help you and He will make your feet firm. But you have to take the first step. You have to do your part. And as for the disbelievers, then there is ruin for them and their deeds are invalidated. Why? Because they dislike something that Allah has revealed. And if they dislike what Allah has revealed, then Allah Azza wa Jal will not allow their actions to remain valid. The example in um, verse 12, in the example of people who live in this world but don't acknowledge its creator, Allah says, they're enjoying their time here and they're eating and it's, it's obvious, you can see them you can see them enjoying life but Allah says their example is like cattle that are grazing in a field كَمَا تَأْكُلُ الْأَنْعَامِ 
like cattle are grazing. Now, nobody raises, nobody sends out cattle to graze for the well-being of those cattle. You don't send the cows out to pasture because you love cows. You might love cows, that's fine. But this is a commodity that's going to be used. Ultimately, they are going to be butchered. The same thing happens with lambs, sheep, goats. Why do you raise them? Why do you feed them? So, there is a difference in the way a believer lives in this world and the purpose of it and the outcome of it. And the way somebody who does not acknowledge the existence of Allah, the way they spend their time in this world is very, very different. So they're allowed to graze from this pasture because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no value for this, for this dunya. But where are they headed? Allah says, save yourselves from a fire, the fuel of which is people and stones. So that is going to be their ultimate, their ultimate goal or objective. But they're not being fed for themselves. They're not being fed for their, any more than people raise cows and feed them so that they can, you know, they can grow up and have great families uh, you know, in, you know, in the, and, and have great communities of cows. Just like that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, is the case for these people. And as for those people, that city that has expelled you, people of Mecca, I have destroyed many cities that were much powerful, much more powerful and fortified than, those, uh, than that city. Then Allah says, He gives another example, that on one side there is a person who has clear guidance from Allah. On the other side, you have someone whose misdeeds are made to seem attractive. He thinks that's guidance. He thinks that that is guidance. But it's actually his own misdeeds. It seems very appealing to him. And it's a mixture of his own desires. That's essentially what's happening. Allah says that these two people cannot be the same just like the, just like the drinks of Jannah and the drinks of Jahannam cannot be the same. Allah says the drinks of Jannah, that the, that the muttaqeen, the pious have been promised. There are rivers of water that does, never, that, does, that does not stagnate, it does not grow stale. And rivers of milk, the taste of which, the flavor of which will never change. It's never going to grow sour or bitter, it's never going to go bad. Why? Because this milk has not come from the bellies of animals. This milk has come directly from the treasures of Allah. And rivers of wine which are pure pleasure for those who drink. So pure pleasure means that there is no adverse effect. There are no headaches and hangovers, no drunkenness and intoxication. So, لا يصدعون عنها ولا ينزفون no headaches and there is no you know, drunkenness where a person loses their mind or loses their, their faculties of reasoning. No. It's just pure pleasure and rivers of pure honey, completely pure honey. And this honey has not been produced in the bellies of bees. And that wine has not come out of grapes that were, that were pressed and crushed by people. No. All of this is coming from the treasures of Allah. So on one side you have those and plus all types of fruits and forgiveness along with forgiveness. Can you compare that to a person who has to go into Jahannam and وَسُقُوا مَاءً حَمِيمًا amaahum. The only thing he gets to drink is boiling water which tears, it rips apart his intestines. So just like that, just like these two types of drinks cannot be the same, the person who is doing those actions leading to that direction and the one doing the actions leading to the other direction, these people cannot be the same. Some of them come and listen to you, but then when they leave, they go to the people of knowledge in their community, like the rabbis, and they say, Mada qala anima? What is it that he said? We don't understand any of it. So the reason why they don't understand is because Allah SWT has put a seal, a stamp on their hearts, that nothing is going to go in. And as for those who have received guidance, 
زَادَهُمْ هُدًا وَآتَاهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ Allah increases their guidance more and more and more. The attitude of the believers is Lola Nuzirat Surah. We wish another surah would be revealed. When is the next surah going to be revealed? So we can hear it. We can hear the next news that Allah has to give us. But then, when a surah is revealed that is muhkam, yani there's nothing of it that is, that is abrogated, that is mansukh, and qital is mentioned, battle is mentioned in it, you will see that those who have the disease in your heart, they'll look at you like someone who is about to die. نَظَرَ الْمَغْشِيَ عَلِيهِمْ Somebody who is passing out and in the throes of death. Meaning it's like death when they hear this. It's like, no, 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 no. This is not possible for us. So Allah says that what is, what is the duty? طَاعَةٌ وَقَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ The duty is to obey and whenever an instruction comes to say good things. فَإِذَا عَزَمَ الْأَمْرُ When things get serious and it's actually time. For example, there is an attack. As an example, there is an expedition that the Prophet ﷺ is sending you on. فَلَوْ صَدَقُوا اللَّهَ If they proved themselves true to Allah, it would have been much better for them. So Allah says, what else will you do? If you do not oblige by my commands, what is it that, will, that you will do? Uh, is it that if you will turn away, and then you will cause trouble in the world, and you will sever all your relationships, what is it that you will do? So those who do this are the ones that Allah has cursed, and He has made them, he has made them deaf and blind. So in this also is a warning for, for severing uh, blood relations. Don't they reflect on the Qur'an or is it that their hearts have locks on them? Am ala qulubin aqfaluha That they're locks that nobody can open and that's why the message of the Qur'an is not going through. And then those who turn away on their heels after uh, hidayat has become clear for them, those who turn away from that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deal with them in the most, uh, in the most strict way. There are people who harbor secret hatred, secret enmity. So do they think, have they assumed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not reveal it? And they have these feelings of hatred against the Prophet ﷺ, against the Muslims, against Islam. They're hiding it because it's not uh, convenient or it's not politically correct to voice those types of thoughts at that time. Allah says that He will reveal your hatred. It's just a matter of time. Situations will occur and your true nature will become obvious. And Allah says, I will continue putting them through trials until I can see who are those who strive and, and the patient ones and who are, what is, what do you have inside? And then the outcomes of those people again who fight against Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi um, First of all, they cannot harm Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in the least. And secondly, if they die, on kufr, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive them. Don't fall weak and in a state of weakness, settle for peace. فَلَا تَهِنُوا وَتَدْعُوا إِلَى السَّلْمِ Peace has its own objectives. It has its own framework. It has its own benefits. But don't talk about peace because you're cowardly. This is not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to settle for peace because we're too cowardly to fight. But rather we settle for peace because it's the right thing to do at that time. And when the time to fight comes and there's no option, then the Muslim, the Muslim ummah should not become cowards and, and start retreating and say, no, 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 let's talk about peace now. Like, you know, for the last couple of decades... You know, Islam is a religion of peace. Islam is a religion of peace. Islam is a religion of peace. Like, yani, this was shouted off the rooftops, literally. You know, every member was saying this. Every uh, seminar and conference was saying this, everything. And it's true, Islam is a religion of peace. But Islam isn't just peace no matter what people do to you. Islam is not about being trampled on and having no self-respect. Islam is not about humiliating yourself so that people accept you. Yes, there is a message of peace in Islam. Absolutely, no doubt. Islam invites towards peace. Islam is a religion of peace. But Islam is, is not a religion of peace in the sense that no matter what you do, what you say, what you take away from us, we will always have peace. Because that just, that's just another word for saying we're cowards. 
The Muslims are not cowards. They know how to look the enemy in the eye and say, you know what, if you come after us, we're ready for you. So there needs to be a balanced discourse about Islam. Not a one-sided discourse. Islam is not a religion of war, where it's promoting war. And it's not just a religion of peace, that no, no, it's just peace, 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 peace. Don't talk, about, don't talk about jihad, don't talk about war. Every country is prepared to talk about war. Every country, every, every sovereign nation says, we are prepared for it if it comes to that. So, they have the right to do that. So where are the Muslims? So our problem is we have fallen so weak, so weak, and the Qur'an is speaking to people like us. فَلَا تَهِينُوا وَتَدْعُوا دَسَّلَمْ Don't invite towards peace because you're a coward. This is not the right way. What will that do to the enemies of Islam? Those who want to crush out Islam, they say, you know, we've got them right where we want them. We can do anything we want. So, Allah says, yes, your, the worldly life is often what brings us to that position, our worldly interests. Allah says, in al hayat dunya la wallahu. Don't take this worldly life too seriously. It is leisure and play. If you remain steadfast on your iman and taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you your rewards. And He will not take away all your wealth. Because even if He, if he were to, you would, you would prove to be very, very miserly and stingy. And your inner weaknesses would come out. Look, on this occasion, you're asked to come and spend in the path of Allah, but some of you are being miserly even over here. But remember, whoever acts miserly, it's only against himself. He's actually being miserly from himself. When we spend in the path of Allah, we're actually spending on ourselves. Why? Because who's going to get the reward? We're going to get the reward. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give us the returns. So Allah says, whoever is being miserly, he's being miserly against himself. It works in the opposite way. Wallahu al-ghani wa antum al-fuqara. Allah is the, the rich, the independent. You are the needy ones. And if you turn away, if you say, no, we can't do this, if you walk away from the call of deen when it is made, Allah will bring another nation in your place, they will not be like you. Something to be afraid of. Allah SWT does not need us. He's not in need of us. That was the conclusion of Surah uh, Muhammad. And after this is Surah Al-Fatih. This is a Madani Surah. Of 29 verses, it was revealed. After, it was revealed following Sulh al hudaybiyyah So, in the sixth year of Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ took the Sahaba, and they went for Umrah. He, alayhi salatu wasalam, saw a dream that he is he and his companions are entering into Makkah, performing Umrah, and then they are becoming halal. They're cutting their hair and shaving their hair, and so he says, "I have been." Shown this by Allah, let's go for Umrah. So a large group of Sahaba, maybe some 1400 people joined them. And at the outskirts of Mecca at Hudaybiyah, they were stopped. The Quraysh said, no, you can't go further. And some narrations mentioned that they attacked some of the Sahaba who were by, coming from the side of Tan'im. Some 70 Sahaba were attacked. So the Prophet ﷺ had a, a decision to make. He, he said, from now on, there's only one of two things that can happen. It's going to be either war or peace. We have to decide what it's going to be. So he said, look, I'm offering you peace. I'm offering you a peace treaty. And if you accept it, that's fine. If you don't accept it, then there's going to be a lot of bloodshed. Because we are not going to tolerate this, this kind of treatment. Okay. <laughs> so they thought about it, and so they came up with this treaty. And... Uh, they brought the terms. And the terms seemed very one-sided. Firstly, the Muslims would not be allowed to perform Umrah this year. They wouldn't be allowed to come back the next year, only for three days, without any weapons uh, on display. They could do their Umrah, stay for three days, and then they had to leave. The second thing is that there would be a ceasefire for the next ten years. And uh, neither party would violate that. The third thing was that if a Muslim defected over to Mecca and chose to live there in Mecca, the people of Mecca would not send him back. So there would be no uh, extradition agreement on the side of Mecca. However, 
if somebody from Makkah defected over to Medina, the Makkans had the right to extradite them, and the, and, and the people of Medina, meaning the Muslims, would have to send them back. And another one of the terms of the agreement was that all the tribes of the Arabs were free to join whoever they wanted in this treaty. They could join Quraysh on their side of the treaty, and then they would be their hulafa, their allies. They could join the Muslims and be their allies. So this seemed like a very lopsided agreement, a very one-sided agreement, and the Sahaba were not happy at all. But the Prophet ﷺ approved it, and um, you know, very in a very disappointed way, and and with broken hearts, they had to go back, and they had to become halal first. So that's when the, and the and the Sahaba and the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they had brought animals to slaughter, and so uh, he Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them to um, slaughter the animals and cut their hair so they could become halal and go back come out of ihram. So Sahaba Radiallahu Anhum were too stunned to even respond. They just could not. They were so depressed that after this many years, after six years of being deprived of Baytullah, where we grew up, which was our home. And now we're not being allowed. What is going on? So he, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi went into his tent and consulted with Umm Salama radiallahu anha. That look, I've given the instruction, but it seems like they haven't even heard it. So she, she explained to him that they are in shock. They're stunned. They don't know what to do. So it's better that you demonstrate for them what it is that you want. So once you go and slaughter your animals and have your hair cut, they will understand what the message is. So the Prophet ﷺ did that and all the Sahaba them, they followed suit. Now they go back very dejectedly and, and sadly and many questions are being raised. Somebody asks uh, Abu Bakr anhu that isn't he the true messenger of Allah? He says yes. He said, well didn't he tell us that we will enter uh, Al-Masjid Al-Haram and we will perform Umrah and become Halal? He said yes. But did he promise you that it's going to happen this year? No. It will happen. He is the true messenger of Allah. And everything he has said is the truth. This is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So like this, these discussions were going on. Sahaba radiallahu anhum were going back. And they feel like they lost something. Um, you know, and they, they feel humiliated. On the way back, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals this surah. And what does it say? Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. We've given you open victory. Sahaba are saying, victory? It doesn't look victorious. We're, <laughs> we're going back. We came for Umrah to the house of Allah. We were deprived of that. We're going back in this, uh, in this new treaty now, which is humiliating us. Where is the victory? Subhanallah. Allah says, we have given you open victory. And this victory is such that it will get all your past and future mistakes erased and it will perfect Allah's ni'mas on you and it will guide you to the straight path this is that kind of conquest and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help is coming it's going to be very very powerful help so what happened where was the element of victory you see after this treaty and because of the ceasefire people now could openly travel to Medina and many tribes were waiting for this. They could not come because of constant fear of being attacked. That if we make a move towards Medina, we will get, we will get attacked by those who are opposing the Prophet ﷺ. With this ceasefire in place, people now started flooding Medina. And more people in, in the subsequent year, more people accepted Islam than all the previous six years. In that one year. Yani the floodgates just opened. And people started rushing into, into Islam. Khair. Immediately after this, uh, there was another expedition that the Prophet ﷺ had planned. And that was to Khaybar. To go and take over Khaybar. Because Banu Nadir had caused so much trouble. They had made it impossible for the Muslims to live in peace. So as soon as he came back, he went off to Khaybar. And had as far as Hudaybiyah is concerned, you will know that uh, the year after, the seventh year, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions did come back. They performed the Umrah, stayed for three days, went back, 
few months, four or five months after that, the Quraysh attacked some of the allies of the Muslims while they were sleeping. They were in the middle of the night, they went and they butchered them in their sleep. And the Prophet ﷺ then sent a message that either there's only there's a couple of options here. One option is you get us the blood money for all of our people that we lost. The second thing is those people who committed this act, you remove them from your treaty, you exit them from your side of the treaty, and you announce that they are no longer your allies. If you can do this, that's fine, the ceasefire will remain. Otherwise, the last option is you break the treaty. So, um, you know, in their pride and conceit, they said, we're breaking the treaty. <laughs> then they, after some time, they announced it, that we've broken the treaty, and then they regretted it, and Abu Sufyan traveled to Medina, and he tried to convey, convince and persuade, and it's too late. You've broken the treaty, you've announced it, it's broken now. Khair. So coming back to here, this doesn't go into all of that. It's simply that at Sulh al Hudaybiyah, the Prophet wasallam took bay'ah from all the Sahaba. When did this bay'ah happen? Initially, he had sent Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu to go and talk to the people to, to negotiate uh, as the emissary, as the delegate or the ambassador of the Muslims. And news spread that Uthman has been killed by the Meccans. So at that time, the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, if this is the case, then we are going to rush in. Because we are pilgrims, and we sent him as a delegate, and they killed him. Now we will take revenge for Uthman. So the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba, he sat under a tree, and he took bay'ah. He took bay'ah from them, that they will stay with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they will fight until this matter is solved and Uthman Radiyallahu is avenged. And because he himself was not there, he took one of his hands and he put it in his other hand and he said, this is on behalf of Uthman. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that, لَقَدْ رَضِيَ الله. It comes later on. But here in the opening, he says that those who pledge allegiance to you in the الَّذِينَ يُبَايِعُونَكْ إِنَّمَا يُبَايِعُونَ اللَّهِ They're in fact pledging their allegiance to Allah. Allah's hands are over their hands that they are putting in your hand. But anyone who breaks it, who he breaks it to his own detriment, to his own harm. And whoever fulfills the promise that he has made to Allah, Allah will give him great reward. So, the Prophet ﷺ comes back from Hudaybiyah and he is preparing to go for Khaybar. Now, in the minds of most people, Khaybar was going to be a very easy victory. And Khaybar was loaded with wealth, with, there was going to be a lot of spoils of war gained to be gained from Khaybar. So everyone wanted to go to Khaybar. But when the Prophet ﷺ came back, he said, he announced that only those people who went with me and participated in Hudaybiyah will be allowed to go with me to Khaybar. Now, many people at that time in Medina, they said, they said, these guys are going to Mecca. What's wrong with them? They're crazy. They're going to get killed. It's suicide. So oh, we're not going, we're not going, we're not going. So, when they, when they found out that only the same people are allowed to go, so those who stayed behind from Hudaybiyah, they started coming to the Prophet and trying to convince him. Oh, shagalatna. Some of them said, shagalatna amwaluna wa ahluna. You know, we just got so busy with our families and with our uh, properties and our work. Uh, we just couldn't come. We really wanted to, but we just couldn't. Fastaghfir, ask Allah to forgive us. Allah says, these are some of those miraculous occasions in the Qur'an where the Qur'an just exposes people just like that, openly. Allah says they're saying with their tongues that which is not in their heart. So tell them that if Allah wants you to be harmed, is there anyone that can stop it? No, no one can stop it. If Allah has written for you to be harmed, you'll be harmed right here in Medina. And if Allah has written for you to gain benefit or to be saved, you'll be saved no matter where you go. So rather, what is truly in your hearts is that you were hoping that the Prophet ﷺ and the believers will never return. And then Medina will be all yours. This is what you were secretly hoping. So you people are ruined. And some will come and they'll just, they won't say anything for 
uh, for an excuse, but they'll just say, let us come with you. When you go to get the booty, the spoils of war, they, say, they will say, let us come along, let us follow you. يُرِيدُونَ أَن يُبَدِّلُوا كَلَامُ اللَّهِ They want to change the decision that Allah has passed. That decision has come from Allah. That only the people who went with you the first time will go on this one. So tell them Allah has already decreed this. What are they going to say? Allah tells them. This is what they will respond. فَسَيَقُولُونَ They will say to you, you will see, Oh, you're just jealous of us. You don't want us to have a share in, in, in that wealth. So tell them, those people who stayed back from that, from the first expedition, tell them that there will be other occasions in which you will be called to fight strong enemies. You will fight them to the extent that they submit. If you obey at that time, then Allah SWT will reward you. And if you turn away like you turned away this time, then Allah will punish you. So now you have to wait. Wait for the next opportunity that will come. Yes, those, are, those who are blind or lame or sick, there is no harm on them. If, you're, if there's an expedition, you're sick, you're ill, there is no sin if you stay behind. But those who, who turn away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them. And then Allah announces that He was pleased with the believers when they took bay'ah on His hands under that tree. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew the truthfulness, the truthful intentions in their hearts. And so He sent Sakina from the heavens and he وَأَثَابَهُمْ فَتْحًا qariba. Because they showed their readiness to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah said, look at this, أَثَابَهُمْ فَتْحًا qariba. Allah decreed that you will have a conquest very soon. This was in result. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala had all of this happen to test the believers how strong are they when they are really pushed to the limit. Will they persevere or not? Because they passed that test under the bay'ah of shajara, the reward was you get the conquest of Makkah. Makkah is yours. This is being announced here. You will have it. And yes, when you go back there, magani makathiratan yakhudunaha, you will you will also conquer Khaybar and you will get much wealth from there. And this is these are the workings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khair, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions that this was a favor of Allah that when you were there outside Mecca, neither you did not engage in an open war. It would have been very messy. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept them away from you and kept you away from them. And then it was just a matter of time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you dominance over them. Some further details about the conquest of Mecca were mentioned, and also that one of the things, uh, one of the outcomes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them from is that if they had rushed into Mecca, they would have killed a lot of people blindly. And they would have killed the people of Mecca, and many of them had secretly accepted Islam. And it was not halal for you to kill them. But you would not be able to differentiate because they have not had the chance to migrate, so you don't know who they are. So Allah says that, وَلَوْلَا رِجَالُ مُؤْمِنُونَ وَنِسَاءُ مُؤْمِنَاتِ لَمْ تَعْلَمُوهُمْ You don't know them. أَن تَطَأُوهُمْ And then you would have trampled over them and then you would have had to pay blood money for every single one of them because they would have been killed wrongfully. So these are all the wisdoms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as far as that dream that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw about entering Makkah, Allah azza wa jalla announces, لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ Allah says, I showed my Nabi that dream and it was absolutely true. And you will certainly enter Al-Masjid Al-Haram, inshaAllah, peacefully, in a state of peace. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first created peace, the Salam Hudaybiyah, and then entered, and then had them enter into Al-Masjid Al-Haram. And yes, you will shave your heads and you will trim your hair and you will have nothing to fear. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is indeed the messenger of Allah. And those who are with him, they have proven that they can be very tough against their enemies, the disbelievers. But amongst them, they are very merciful. You will find them prostrating and bowing in front of Allah, seeking Allah's pleasure. And you will see the signs of sujood in their faces. And this 
description of theirs has already been given in the Torah and in the Injil. These people have already been described. And what was their example? Their example was like a, a crop that grows. It starts with a small shoot that comes out of the ground from that plant. And then that shoot becomes stronger and thicker. It becomes a stalk. And then on that stalk, that stalk becomes the stem for an entire plant, whether it's some kind of grain or it is some kind of fruit or whatever it is. But gradually, slowly, in the beginning, the beginning phases are not known to anyone. It's all happening under the ground. And then when it emerges, it's very weak and flimsy. But over time, it gets stronger and stronger. It's able to stand and it's able to withstand many winds and many things. And the next thing you know, it's a whole crop. So... It impresses, it impresses the farmers, those who have planted it, and the disbelievers are angered by it. These are the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After this is Surah Al-Hujurat. This is a Madani Surah with 18 verses. And this Surah is filled with many um, social teachings and etiquette. So the first thing is, Adab with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the first topic in this Surah. لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله واتقوا الله. Don't try to do things before Allah and His Rasul have given you permission. And if the Prophet ﷺ is going to, is about to do something, don't go and do it before him. So لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله واتقوا الله. Fear Allah. Allah hears and He knows. Second thing, don't raise your voices higher than the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. So behind each of these is an incident. I won't go into that. I'll just give you the, the teachings very, um, in a very summarized way. So do not raise your voices over the voice of the Prophet ﷺ and do not speak to him in a loud tone. Like you would informally uh, and casually with each other. Raising your voice, you know, yelling across the room, yelling over a distance. Allah says that if you were to do that, all your good deeds will go to waste. Any one act... Of that, that is khilaf of adab. One act that is against the etiquette of the Nabi وسلم, could result in all your good deeds going to waste. Those, surely those who keep their voices lowered in the presence of the Prophet, وسلم, these are the ones whose hearts Allah has tested for iman, for taqwa, and they have passed that test. These are the people of piety, they will get forgiveness and immense rewards. But those who call you from outside your, your quarters. So there was a group of people that came into Medina to accept Islam. And they wanted, when they would want to talk to the Prophet ﷺ, they would call him from outside his house. They would say, Ya Muhammad, Ya Muhammad. He's inside. He has gone inside after Allah knows what a tiring and exhausting day. And they're standing outside and calling him. Allah says, Inna ladina yunadunak. Those who call out to you from outside your quarters, akhtharuhum la yaqilun. Most of them have no sense. If they had been, now Allah teaches the etiquette, walaw annahum sabaru. So these people don't have understanding. But if they had been patient until you came out yourself, it would have been better for them. That patience, that time of, of being patient, because what is it that they need? They have questions for the Prophet. If they waited for him to become available, it would have been much better. The Prophet would not have been disturbed in this way. Then another. Um, you can say social etiquette, that when somebody who is openly disobedient comes to you, yani somebody who is not necessarily practicing the deen, when they come to you with news, فَتَبَيَّنُوا then verify. You need to verify, you need to authenticate, because it could be that you attack or hurt or say something about people unknowingly, and then you will be the ones to regret it. This is about the rumor mill. When something comes through the rumor mill, um, through the grapevine, heard this and this and this and this, before you pass it on, make sure you verify it. Because you don't know what the actual source is. Where did this come from? The actual source could be somebody who has an agenda. So sometimes what happens is the person who brought the news to us is fiqa, they're reliable, but they have been fed the news from someone who just wants to spread the news. And we see this on our social media 
channels, you know, these WhatsApp groups and chats. There's forwards coming, you know, left, right, and center. And people think that anything that has a, you know, a religious theme of some sort, I must, I must be getting reward if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm spreading it. But how much of it is authentic? How much of it is correct? And the same thing happens when we talk about news and rumors. This happened, that happened. You know, there's constantly news that is breaking around the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. There's all kinds of, you know, very challenging things happening. So what is not needed is that rumors um, and, and, you know, and, and false pieces of information are, you know, are fed into that because it could cause a lot of pain or panic for some people. It could cause a lot of distress for some people. So we need to verify what it is. And you know, the rule is, like Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُدْ Speak good or stay quiet. Speak good and or stay quiet if it's not good. So you sit and think for a minute, how good is it? Is this really good? Is this something that would add value to someone's day? Because, you know, just for, for increasing, this is just for information, just for information, and we have this thing, forwarded as received. Just forwarded as received. Like, as if, as if this is some kind of a disclaimer. No. Up ahead we read in Surah Qaf, مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيمٌ عَتِيدٌ Every word we utter, and the same thing, every forward that you pass on, there is someone documenting it. It's as if you said it, as if you, you have conveyed that to someone. We are responsible for it. Forwarded as received, it does not work in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, verify. And you should know that amongst you is the Messenger of Allah. If He were to start following you, in most of the things that you do, then you as a nation would be humiliated. So that's why he does not, he is not here to follow you and, uh, and subject himself to your whims, but rather it's the opposite way around. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, O Muslims, He has given you the iman, and He has made iman beloved to you in your hearts. He has adorned it in your hearts. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in your hearts a dislike for disbelief and, and disobedience. And the people who have managed to do that, they are the rightly guided ones. The next is, if there are two groups from the believers who are fighting, two groups, we've never seen that, have we? Never. Two groups of the Muslims fighting. What is the command? فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا Help them resolve the issue. Rectify, mend, help mend the broken bond between them. Yes, if one is acting aggressively against the other, they're hurting the other, then your job is to stand against and fight against the one who is acting aggressively until they come back to the command of Allah. Then, once they come back to the command of Allah, meaning they stop doing, they stop causing the trouble, then again renew the talks, the discussions of musalaha, of some kind of uh, agreement, some kind of, you know, um, some kind of a peace and understanding. And when you make peace between them, do it bil adl wa aqsitu, be fair. Don't do it being one-sided, being more inclined towards one or the other. So those people who are mending the ties need to be very, very balanced and moderate and fair. Believers are brothers, so rectify, mend the situations amongst your brothers and keep fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that you get His mercy. And the next instruction is that Group of you should not make fun of another group, whether it's men making fun of men or women making fun of, of, of women, because it could be that the people you're ridiculing are actually better than you. And this is a very a serious thing, that sometimes we mock someone for some feature. Now examples of this, what are mentioned in the books of Tafsir, for example, someone in, insulted, some of the wives of the Prophet wasallam. they made a... Um, they made an allusion to Safiya radiallahu anha, Safiya bint Huyay, that she is Yahudiya bint Yahudiyin. 
she's Jewish and she's from, you know, she's a daughter of Jews. And uh, she was very hurt by this because she accepted Islam. She accepted Islam. She had accepted Islam even before the Battle of Khaybar. And right after the Battle of Khaybar, she married the Prophet So she came to the Prophet and said, they're saying these things. So he said, look, if what they're saying is true, or if they're saying this to you, then you tell them that, okay, fine. Then in that case, then Musa alayhi salam is my father, Harun alayhi salam is my uncle, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam is my husband. You respond like this. Similarly, someone hinted towards another and, you know, using their hand to show that she's short. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he saw this, he said that you have said such a thing that if it were to be mixed with the oceans, it would change the water of the oceans. It would change the taste of the oceans. And it is something so bitter. It is something so nasty. So the Prophet ﷺ on many occasions has warned us about this. So we should not ridicule anyone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was so cautious about this. He says, I am so careful that I am afraid that if I were to make fun of a dog, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might turn me into a dog as a punishment. And, وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't criticize each other. وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ Don't make names for each other and then call each other by those names. These are names of insult, names to make fun of someone or a name that belittles someone. And this is, uh, you know, بِئْسَ الْإِسْمُ الْفُسُوقِ بَعْدَ iman. You know, to have a title of being disobedient is a terrible thing after being a believer because these things make you into a disobedient person. Anyone who doesn't do tawbah, then they are zalim. O believers, abstain from most assumptions. Dhan, assumptions, speculations. Stay away from most of it. In the ba'd of dhanni ithm, because some of it is, itself is a sin. And in one hadith, Sahih hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, Iyakum wa dhan, fa inna dhanna akdabu al hadith. Beware of assumptions, conclusions that you, just, that you jump to, because they are the greatest lie. They are the greatest lie. So, stay away from assumptions. Some assumptions themselves are a sin. Do not spy on each other and do not backbite. Would you like to eat the flesh of your brother after he has died? You would not. So, backbiting someone is just like consuming their flesh after they have died. Why after they have died? Because just like the mayyit is unable to protect themselves and defend themselves, the person who is absent is not able at that moment to defend themselves against whatever it is that we're saying. And ghiba is dhikruka akhaka bima yakra. Mentioning someone in a way that they would not like it. Just talking about them in a way that would hurt them, that would upset them. And that's if it's true. If what you're saying is actually, sometimes we say, no, no, but it's true. Even if, if it's true, then it's ghiba. And the Prophet ﷺ said, if it's not true, then you've slandered, which is an even greater sin. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, look, I've created you from a male and a female, and I have put you into communities, into societies, shu'uban, wa qaba'il, in tribes, lita'arafu. So you recognize each other. Not everyone has to be the same. Allah Azza wa Jal does not want all of us to be the same. These differences come from the div- this diversity, ethnic diversity, cultural diversity, diversity in colors, diversity in languages. These are gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to learn about each other. Lita'arafu to learn about each other and to become familiar with each other amidst and uh, along with our differences. So as far as respect is concerned, the most respectable in the sight of Allah is only the one who is most God-fearing. Then a group of people came to the Prophet ﷺ and they claimed that they're believers. We have iman, we have iman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet ﷺ accepted their iman. He said, that's good. But Allah Azza wa Jal revealed these verses that these Bedouins have come and said that they, they are believers. Tell them you are not believers yet, but rather you should say we have accepted Islam. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Iman has not yet entered into your hearts. Yes, you've become Muslim, you've entered. But the reality of iman has not entered into your hearts. So what must you do now? What is required? Busy yourselves in the obedience of Allah and His Rasul. 
And if you do that, Allah will not let any of your actions go to waste. Every action will bring you closer to that Iman. In Allah Ghafoorur Rahim. And why wouldn't He? He's already pardoned all your sins. Just by becoming Muslim, He's forgiven everything. So now if you start doing good deeds, will He allow things to go to waste? No, He will not. Then Allah says, let me tell you who the believers are. Who the actual believers are. The true believers are the ones who have a certain level of belief in Allah and His Rasul, and they have no doubts. Doubts and weaknesses of faith have left from them, and they demonstrate their iman by striving with their wealth and with their lives in the path of Allah. Ula'ika humus sadiqoon. These are the people that when they say they have iman, they are speaking the truth. And some people, they showed to the Prophet ﷺ that look, you know, we've, we've accepted Islam, we've accepted Islam. So tell them, these people that are coming to you and almost expressing a favor upon you of accepting Islam, tell them, don't show me your favor by accepting Islam. Rather, Allah has favored you by giving you Islam. After this is Surah Qaf, a Makki Surah. 45 verses. The opening is about the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially in the earth, um, how things grow, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down rain and produces all kinds of beautiful, um, beautiful vegetations. Then the denial of the nation of Nuh, alayhi salam, ashab al ras, Thamud, Ad, Fir'aun. The people of Lut alayhi salam, the people of Madian, the people of Tubba, these were all nations. Kullun kathabar rusul. The one thing they had in common is they all rejected their prophets. Fahaqqa wa'id. My warning came into action. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not only created the human being, but He knows the thoughts that go through His mind and His heart. He knows the whispers that take place inside. That self-talk that no one else can hear, it's happening in our minds. Allah Azza wa is aware of that. And we are closer to Him than His own jugular vein. And then on the Day of Judgment, what will happen? How people will be presenting themselves towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But before that, He reminds us that every word that the human being says there is Raqibun Atid, there is an angel who is there. He is supervising the situation and he is prepared to document it right away. And then the pangs of death will come, surely. Waja'at Sakratul Mauti Bil Haq. They will surely come. This is what you are trying to escape. And at its fixed time, the horn will be blown. That is the day of warnings. And everyone will come, everyone will come. Ma'aha Sa'iqun wa Shaheed. There will be angels that will be dragging them and all the witnesses will also be with them. And they will be told that, look, you were in complete negligence about all of this. Now we have removed the curtain and today your eyes are sharp. Today you can see things for what they really are. And the, um, his companion will say that, throw this person, throw this person into Jahannam. He was like this and like this and like this. And this is the person who, um, who led him astray. Yani the one that he used to follow will be saying this against him. Have him thrown into Jahannam. He'll be telling the angels, toss him. He was like this, he was like this. And then that companion will say, Rabbana ma atagaytuhu. I was not the one who led him astray. He will be trying to justify himself. Walakin kana fi dalalim ba'id. He was lost himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, La takhtasimu ladayi. Don't argue in front of me. وَقَدْ قَدَّمْتُ إِلَيْكُمْ بِالْوَعِيدِ I have already sent you my warnings. مَا يُبَدَّلُ الْقَوْلُ لَدَيْهِ Words, rules do not change in my court. وَمَا أَنَا بِظَلَّامِ لِلْعَبِيدِ So each will go to their destination. On the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after throwing many, many people into Jahannam, He will ask Jahannam, هَلِمْ تَلَأْتِي O Jahannam, are you full yet? And what answer will Jahannam give? هَلْ مِمْ مَزِيد Are there more? I can take them. Allahu Akbar. How dreadful, how frightening. Hal min mazid. And on the other side, Jannah will be brought close to the pious people. 
And Allah will say that this is what you have been promised. Now you enter peacefully. That is a day where you will enter and remain forever. So in conclusion, be patient over what they are saying. And do tasbih of your, of your Lord qabla tulur al-shams before sunrise and before sunset. Now you can see this has come several times. Those of you who have been attending regularly, this every now and then, this comes, this reminder to guard that time and devote it to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah azza wa jal give us tawfiq and give us istiqamah on this. And wastami'a yawma yunadil munadi min makanin qareeb and listen for that day when a caller will call out min makanin qareeb from a place close by. Some of the tabi'is have said and I think it's some sahaba also who said that that Makan in Qareeb will be Bayt al-Maqdis. That is where people will be called from. And in other hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ardul Mahshari wal Manshar. That is the land where people will be gathered towards. Khair. We are the ones who give life and take it away. Everyone comes back to us. Yawma tashaqqaqul ardu anhum sira'a. The earth will split open and it will cast the people out. And there they will be in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After this is Surah al dhariyat We read a, a part of it. dhariyat these are the winds. These are the winnowing winds. With dhariyat darwa falhamilat wiqra Those winds that are carrying massive, massive loads like the clouds, for example. And the clouds have immense, immense weight, but they float around as if they're weightless. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put winds to this work. They are carrying them. And they move very quickly. And they divide things, they distribute things, they go off in different directions. Allah says, look, I swear by these winds, everything you have been promised in this book from Allah and from His Rasul is true. The day of uh, compensation is going to happen. And then the outcomes of the people who disbelieved and who just worked on their own conjecture using their own logic, their own ways of logic, Allah says, قُتِلَ الْخَرَّاسُونَ these are khurrasun. These are people who just give their own estimates based on their understanding. What they understood, Allah says, these people are ruined. And some of the qualities of the believers, of the, of the people of taqwa, is that they spent their life in a state of ihsan. First of all, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَبْلَ ذَلِكَ muhsinin, With the quality of ihsan, which generally means to excel in all areas of good. Or specifically with the quality of ihsan, which is to worship Allah as if you can see Him, and if you cannot see Him, then worship as if He is seeing you. It was very less in the night that they would sleep. Even though they would spend most of the nights worshipping, when it was the time for sahar, before fajr, they would engage in istighfar. That's why we should use this time for istighfar. Even if it's just a few times, we should do amal on this. That Allah Azza wa Jal, by His mercy, even though we are not like this, the way the Qur'an is describing, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will include us with those people if we at least try to copy them. So the time of sahar, the time before fajr comes in, is a time for istighfar. This is the dhikr at that time. And in their wealth was a share for two kinds of people. Those who ask for help and those who are deprived and cannot even reach them to ask for help. So they would be helping two kinds of needy people, as-sail wal-mahroom, the one who comes and asks for assistance, but also those who can't. So they will go and look for those people. So these were some of the qualities and then there are some of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after that there is quick reference to that story of Ibrahim alayhi salam being visited by the angels. When they came and said salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam responded with salam. He says, you people are not familiar, you're unfamiliar people, um, but that's okay. Even though they were unfamiliar, right away he rushed and he slaughtered a, um, a calf a nice fat one, a nice plump calf, and presented it to them, and he brought it to them himself. So bringing food to the guests yourselves, and trying to, at that time, prepare the best of what is available. Whatever is available, choose the best of it, and present it to the guests ourselves. This is some of the etiquettes being conveyed here. And won't you eat? 
فَأَوْجَسَ مِنْهُمْ خِيفَةً Then he started getting afraid of them when they, he saw that they're not eating. They said, look, you don't have nothing, you have nothing to be afraid of. And they gave him glad tidings of a, uh, of a boy that he was going to have. So his woman, his wife, um, who was there in the background, she smacked her face out of astonishment. And she said, I am old. I am old and I'm infertile. I'm not able to have children. They said, yes, but this is how Allah is going to do it, even in these circumstances. And then the story continues into the 27th juz, which we will pick up from tomorrow, insha'Allah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Thank you.